Some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. On this episode of Amazing Jamaicans, I will document the story of an extraordinary, courageous and brilliant young lady who, despite her struggles with a life-threatening disease, has been doing wonderful things. She is Abigail Smythe, the woman with the iron heart. Beautiful. Hi. How are you? I'm good. This should have happened a long time ago. Like two, well, Things years. take a little time. Things take a little time. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's great to see you. Yeah, it's, it's great to meet you. I, I told know. you before that you're my favorite person who I haven't met. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> who is Abigail Smythe? Oh boy, um, where do I begin? Abigail Smythe is a 29-year-old young woman mm -hmm. who is very strong. She is courageous. She is fun to be around. She is friendly. She is a fighter. She is a survivor. She is a conqueror. She is all these things and much more. Abigail has been battling many things for a long time. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about the struggles, health-wise. Um, well, I was diagnosed with a rare and progressive heart disease. It's called arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, dysplasia. Yeah. or ARVD for short. Yes. So basically, the right side of my heart is severely diseased the right ventricle doesn't function as it should. I have two leaking valves. My heart is slightly enlarged and my heart race is fast to the point where it can send me to cardiac arrest at any time. So treatment for that is I have to wear an implantable cardioverter defibrillator or ICD for short, or in layman's term, a battery in my chest. Hold it right there. <laughs> and that's a lot. <laughs> when were you diagnosed with arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia? Ah, you know it. <laughs> um, I was diagnosed at 19, officially, but I was having signs and symptoms since I was like seven years old. Mm. So at age seven, I'd get tired very easily. My heart would be racing all the time, shortness of breath. I remember I was at primary school, I was in grade three, and when we came in from lunchtime, everyone had settled down and I was still tired, breathing heavily. My heart was racing like crazy. So I went to my teacher and I said, Miss, feel my heart, it's beating really fast. And when she felt it, she immediately wrote a note for me to take home to my mom. And I took the note home to my mom, and the next day my mom took me to a doctor who sent me to another doctor, who sent me to another doctor. <laughs> so this, the first doctor I went to was in Spalding. He said this is beyond him. So he sent me to one in Mandeville who said it was beyond him. So I went to a specialist in Kingston. And that specialist just listened to my heartbeat and say, I'm fine, there's nothing wrong with me. He didn't do any test or anything. Just use him stethoscope, listen to my heartbeat and say, I'm fine. So all right. Um, Went back to being the typical eight, nine year old, seven, eight, nine year old, I live my life, I ramp hyperactive as hell. Um, then when I reached nine, my mom died. And it turned out she died from the same heart disease. She died in 2002. Yes. Age 39. Yeah, she was We'll 39. come back to that number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then after she died, throughout the years, my, sy my symptoms got worse. So I remember one day I was at community college and I was at home the Sunday. I had school the Monday and from the Sunday I was saying to my cousin that my chest is hurting me really bad. I feel like my heart literally hurt me. And you know, typical Jamaican thing, him said, no man, I guess I kill a drink little tea. <laughs> <laughs> drink little tea and listen my drink tea go my drink tea come me still I feel the pain when me inhale it hurt like crazy by the Monday me I go to school me I walk through Spalling Town the pain feel worse me can hardly breathe and the way me did look I walk on the road one taxi driver would know me I walk past I drive past and him say slim as I want to oh you look so I say carry me down the hospital please jump in the car him drop me to the hospital by the time I reached the hospital, I walked through the corridor 
if I find a nurse, I remember me walk through, cause I can't breathe, me walk through and I rip off my blows, and like me rip it open, cause I just couldn't breathe. I finally find a nurse and them check me, and at that point, them said my blood pressure did high to the point where it could have burst a blood vessel in my head. So that was one thing. Um, they didn't do any extensive investigation into the heart issue. They thought this was because of the extremely high blood pressure. Mm. So them give me meds and injection and thing and them send me home and I continue to go to community college and then go to university and all of these times. NCU? Yeah. We still have experience them somewhere. Reach NCU. Um, I remember one day again chest pain and lick me out of nowhere. I couldn't breathe, my heart just erased, I feel lightheaded like me go pass out. So I call a friend of mine, he's a doctor, Dr. Gilbert Walcott, my bridging, and I say, listen, what the first step in getting thoroughly checked for a heart condition? Cause we can't take this no more. So I say, all right, the first thing we need to do is to do an ECG. So him called me at the hospital, him did the ECG for me and it showed that I have an abnormal heart rhythm. So him referred me to KPH and I went to KPH and KPH referred me to UA hospital and then that's that's where it all began basically from my reach UA. I was basically a lab rat for like a year. I remember the very first test that I did. It was a treadmill stress test then. String me up, bag a wire wire and put me to walk on a treadmill. The doctor said, all right, start walking. When you feel tired, you tell me. So I start walking on the treadmill, and at the point when I told her that I felt tired, she said, your heart start race long before you feel you're tired, so something is definitely not right. Mm -hmm. And she checked the results, and she said, she looked me dead in the face, and she was very honest, she was brutally honest. She said, you might have the same condition that killed your mother. When she said that to me, it's like time stood still. Like, I just freeze and the eye water just swell up in my eye at the same time. And one of my cousins was there with me. She, she was playing the mother role at the time. Mm -hmm. She's an older cousin. And she said, don't cry. You knew all along that something was wrong, but don't cry, everything is going to be okay. So we did that test. We did several other tests after that over a period a couple of months going to a year and I had to be missing a lot of classes and missing schools because of this. So all this time now I miss assignments, I miss exams because I'm stressed out and worried it was affecting my performance in school. So by the end of my first year at NCU having to be at UA almost every week every other week for the whole day it affected my grades. So by the end of the first year <laughs> academic probation almost get kicked out of school so when the chair of the department called me to her office she said your grades are really bad your GPA is really low I think my GPA was at one point something at the time she said you can't get kicked out of school and it was at that point I broke down and I told her everything why I was missing school because I wasn't telling anybody yeah, but, at school because mm -hmm. I said all right mm. I don't think they need to know. So I told her everything. And um, she understood and my whole department supported me from then on. Mm -hmm. But then the time came when- You had to do surgeries. Mm -hmm, I, had, I had to do surgery. I remember there was a time I was at school one day and I felt like I just feel funny, like my heart just uh, hurt me and I feel like I walk on air. And I contacted my doctor and she said, yeah, come back in so we can do some more tests. Have a travel from Mandeville to Kingston again, do more tests. And she said, all right, something is definitely not right. Because by then she had tried me with different medications. She even tried me with about two or three different types of asthma pump to see if it was an issue of underlying asthma because mm -hmm. I was having breathing issues. But that wasn't it. We did the test and she took me to a senior, very senior cardiologist and for a second opinion. And he looked through all the test results over the course of the year, I think, and he said he doesn't see anything wrong. He thinks it's stress. So I said, I'm stressed out from myself until I'm 19. 
<laughs> something all right. Yeah. Something all right. And she said, listen, we know that something is wrong and we're going to get to the bottom of it. We go back home. Symptoms still I get worse and all these things. Go back in for more testing. Then she took me for a third opinion from another doctor. And we went to him and he looked through my files, looked through everything. And he looked at me and he said, you have a heart condition called arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. And the next time your heart races, you can go into cardiac arrest and you can die. And this is what you need. You need and you need a battery in IHS. So I said, all right, this battery thing, how does it work? What does it do? Him tell me. So I said, all right, how much for it? Him said, 15,500. So I said, all right, yeah, cool. Jamaica. Can I get that right now? <laughs> Until the man said US dollars. I said, excuse me? 15,500 US dollars. And that was on a special price. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So I said, sir, I don't... I don't have it. The last time I see so much money on my watch, for moving here, I must see Ocean's Eleven and them time, they're my rap bank card. So I said, I don't know, stress like me, I know where I come. I said, where am I going to get this from? You know, but I, because it was an emergency case, I got assistance from the Minister of Health at the time and family come together, pool resources and thing. And April 5th, 2012 was the day my life would change forever. That was the date of my very first, first surgery. surgery. Yeah. So that's when the day you put in the implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Yeah, you get it. <laughs> yeah, you get it right. Yeah, yeah. that's that's the day I put it oh, in. Oh, see the battery. Yeah, the battery. That's the, the titanium day I put it in. battery. Yeah, titanium. That's the day I put Another it in. Another story that just started right there. Another chapter. <clears throat> Another chapter. I was And what is the what does it do? All firstly? right. So what it does is it monitors my heart, monitors my heart, monitors my every heartbeat, and it corrects the irregular, right. dangerous heartbeats. Mm -hmm. So for example, you have times where my heart will beat too fast. And when my heart beat fast, above a certain rate, I'm at high risk of going into cardiac arrest. I can go into cardiac arrest like that. And in most cases, that's death. Mm -hmm. So when my heart I beat that fast now, the battery picked that up and it shocked my heart for calm it down. So you know you yeah, watch show and you see them hospital show there and you see them rub it together and say really? clear and mm -hmm. shock the person back to life. That that's is basically what it is doing. that's basically it. But mine is in a battery form and them the people they get shocked from the outside, I'm getting shocked from mm -hmm. the inside. So them shocked they know feel like a horse a kick in your chest. It terrible. It it wicked. But it do, it do its job. Yeah, it saved wow. my life two times already. Yeah. So yeah, so that's what it does. It also acts as a pacemaker. So you have some times where my heart would be too slow. Cause you have some times when my heart rate drop all in other forties. Wow. And the battery have to act Look as a up. pacemaker and bring it up to like a sixty thereabout. So that's basically what it does. And if it's a case where it doesn't catch the fast heartbeat in time, which is highly unlikely, but say I pass out and my heart just stops suddenly, then it can shock me back to life. No, that cool. No, <laughs> no, no, that we think about it. Yeah, yeah. so that, that's what it does. Yeah. But this is a foreign object mm -hmm. living in, well, inside of a human's body. Yeah. There must be some issues. Yeah, um, when we put it in April 5th, 2012, um, first thing first, I was scared as hell going into surgery. I've never been admitted to a hospital before. Whenever I got dripped before and then something there, so all of that was new to me and it was scary, but prayer and faith bring me through that. We did the surgery. When we come out of surgery, I realized that I feel a whole heap of pain. And not at the area where I got the surgery incision. Mm -hmm. I feel pain in the middle of my chest. So I said, no man, something all right. I call the nurse. I said, listen, I feel pain. Give me something to eat. I said, oh, when we are on ward or wait and this and that. So I couldn't take it no more. So me and my doctor, by, by this time, we had developed a close relationship. So I messaged him about 12 o'clock the night. And I said, doc, something all right. Please, I can't breathe properly and I feel a whole heap of pain in the middle of my chest. I left where I do, I probably must have left him yard midnight, come out of the hospital and him 
asked me for coffee, mom. I couldn't even do that to how it painful. I couldn't go so. It was that painful. And I ordered a the nurse, them for getting my x ray first thing the following morning. When I tell you I couldn't even stand or sit to do the x ray, the nurse them have to literally hold me up to get the image on my chest. When we go back to the ward, the doctor come and read the results. You know what happened? My lungs them collapse. Wow. So that's why I was feeling that amount of pain, having trouble breathing. So, you know, the <laughs> doctor said, um, all right, we have to go cut you and give you a chest tube. Cut it again? Yeah. Just after the, the Yeah, the, the day implant. after. Yeah. Some of us, some start try to sit up. Some of us are going to go to the theater now. I'm going to put me to sleep and do one another. He said, no, we have to act fast. We have to act right now. So you were awake? I was awake. So they just draw the curtain around my bed, same place on the ward. Give me some injection in on my side. I didn't feel when they were making the, the incision, incision, but yeah. you see. The tube. When the doctor push her finger them in the yeah. cut in my side, if you open it up so, if you make way if you want tube where big so, I never feel so much pain in my life. Like it was so painful, I was hallucinating. While she are putting, no, no. <laughs> me feel it, because I listen to you and I feel it. <laughs> listen, and then because. I seen a doctor was training, must a junior doctor, so he might tell her what to put it in. Mm. She missed the mouth to put it in, so she have to pull it out and put it in again. You see, when she have put it in, I think I got mad. I said, Doc, please, see my cousin over there, so she named Julia Nelson, tell her something I call her. She sit down right up on the chair. Nobody never did it, no chair never did it. To hold the pain hot, me I see things. I never feel so much pain in my life. I had to be on oxygen for about three days straight, day and night. I couldn't sit up, I couldn't walk. I have to, if, if I want to, if I want to urinate, I have to call nurse for bed pan. I'm not used to them. So, me, uh, so that's what I had to go through for about three days, day and night. They see when the doctor to take out what the tube, it better not make it on in there. <laughs> <laughs> I want next. The pain, what, listen, when the man come and say, I take out the tube, your, your lungs seem all right now. You can breathe on your own. You can actually eat now. So we're going to take out the tube. So I'm saying, all right, it's going hot. I'm saying, not as much as when it was going in. So I'm saying, all right, cool. I said, take a deep breath and hold it. And do not let out a breath until the tube is fully out. Because you don't no. want to go back where you come from. So I'm saying, all right. So every time I say, you're ready, I say, all right, ready. Then I say, no, wait, 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 wait. All right, I'm ready now. No, wait, 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 wait. All right. Be a trouble, I'm going to get the man. Then I say, all right, I'm ready. When I held that deep breath, it's when the man pulled out the tube and I took that first breath. I'm going to go, so the hole inside, I'm going to feel empty, feel hollow. It is just very painful. But I recover from that. Thank God, I'm going to get discharged from the hospital. So I go back to my other country because Manchester I live I for their hospital at Kingston. So yeah, I get to go home and all these things and you know you know what know what happened to me after that. I go home and about a week after I went to the hairdresser. So I can't fix up myself so I look so homeless, you know. Mm. So I go to the hairdresser <laughs> and come back and because I did I stayed with my grandmother and she lived up on a hill. Mm. And rain was coming down. So I try to walk fast to come out of the rain. And the walk when I walk fast, my heart rate peak. And the battery detect that. Say it's Shock near you. cardiac arrest. So as I step into the house, it shocked me and my whole body goes so. So I think one of my cousin push me or something. So I turn around and say, oh that I'm not see nobody. By the time I walk through the kitchen and step into the dining room, it licked me again. So I say, oh crap, I shot me, I get shocked. At the home, I did scared. When it shot me, I lean on for my brother because I feel dizzy and out of it. When it shot me, it, my brother feel it. Oh. oh, so that's a powerful shot then, man. Yeah. Can you a chance? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to sit down on the bed and... To how me did afraid me ask my brother for hold my hand. And me and my brother them not live lovey dovey, hug up, hug up, love you, kiss on them something. They will not live so. So I'm asking for hold my hand and it shocked me two more times. And when I was sitting on the bed and it shocked me and my foot them fly up off of the ground. Mm. 
You see when them when it shocked me five times. And you see when I realize it stop shock me. Take up my little blackberry and my message my doctor and say, Dear sir, I come in Monday and you take out back this guy, I never want it. <laughs> <laughs> no, for true, I can't live with this, I'm not used to this. So he asked me what I do sometimes, so I just walk up a hill and him really start explain in depth, say, your life won't be the same, you can't go be as active as I used to be. No running, no jumping, no dancing, because I wanted to be a dancer. I was a bad dancer in high school. No dancing, none of them something there. You may say, boy, I have to accept this. Either I accept it or I take it out and dead. So, I choose to accept it and I just did that for... Adjust. Yeah, adjust my whole life. So, I have to start walk slow. I no run. I no do nothing for make my heart race. I take my medication because I live on medication. I have to live on meds for the rest of my life. That's it. I know a medication have side effects, so I have to take other medication for counter them side effects. Plus expensive. Yeah. Um, anyway, me, I recover from that. I was adjusting, go back to school and trying to settle in. And then one day I noticed that the area looked weird. Like it just, I look weird, like it as well. So every day, I take pictures sent to my doctor and I say, yeah, it, it, it's looking strange. So keep sending me pictures and we watch it. I remember I sent him one picture on Thursday night and him say, yeah, this look really strange. So come see me. I left left Manchester, travel to Kingston. Again, went to see my doctor, him check it, and it turned out that I was having an allergic reaction. So there was fluid gathering around the whole battery, so bay fluid in there. Oh, so it started to, okay. Yeah, it was really swollen. And he drained it the Friday, gave me meds, sent me home. I go back home. By the Sunday, it swelled up again, bare fluid. But they were saying that they couldn't drain it again so quickly because that's risking an infection. So I got meds for it. Go back home, I recover, I try to treat it. Then I start feel pain in the gut some weeks after that. I tell my doctor, I went to see him. He um, said, it seemed like a nerve was damaged during surgery. How they treat that now? He write me a prescription and I had to go back home to Manchester and go to the pharmacy to buy this white thing look like milk it's a liquid and I had to go to the hospital to make a doctor inject it in the cut itself when I heal it so I got several injections in the cut when and that liquid itself when it reached in your body it hot it painful anyway I recover from that I try readjust to normal life and then later down into the year from like September Going down, I realized that the area start look weird. The battery weight that in my chest, it just start look like it a out and stunting a little bit too much every day. Yeah. So I had take pictures. I sent to my doctor and said this, it's looking weird. So I kept sending him pictures, and the, one of the last pictures I sent him, him said, "Yeah, you have to come in, come see me." I go in. And he said, yeah, your body is rejecting the battery, so we'll have to go do surgery again. That's surgery number two. two. Surgery number two. So this was October 2012. I'm back under the knife. After being under the knife, yeah. just April, April 2012. <laughs> yeah, so we did that surgery. Um, we, they put it deeper into my flesh. And I had to sit out that semester again from school. But it was... It was for the best because I, I needed to recover. That surgery was successful. I didn't have any complications from that, thank God. So, going on, adjusting, recovered, and start back school, I think, the January. And me uh, try adjust and all of these things. And then, March 2013, I tried to dance a little bit, I never go uh, just a little bit, and I think the loudspeakers and everything, plus the high heart rate, 
it really peaked and I was close to going into cardiac arrest and the battery of the kick in and shock. Yeah, yeah. And Mel talk hours oh, a night, this was around midnight. So I have a message from my doctor and luckily he was up and he said, All right, may I leave my house and may I meet you over the hospital, so meet me at UE. And I met him there and him checked me and him said, Abby, if you're never having the device for shock yet tonight, you would have gone a cardiac arrest and you would have died. It shot me like six times, I think. Um, what happened was, me did I walk through Yui, forgot the back gate, forget a taxi, forgot about my business. But I see my friend name, I think Carnival did I keep, I see my friend from high school, I stop at chat at music a place, I just bust a one little jiggle, and my heart couldn't manage it. And when it when the battery started shot me, most of the people who were around me, them run to how them did scared. Oh, yeah? Literally, them run, because them did scared, but... One of them stay with me and stay with me till my doctor done with me and <laughs> I get taxi and I go home and for weeks after that I had PTSD like before I get shock it the battery sent a warning so I feel really dizzy and my chest feel funny. So I had that feeling for weeks and I kept feeling like my dog get shocked. So it is just scary, me did stress out, me did just sad. I mean, I said, I can't believe I'm alive this now. What am I supposed to do? I want to be a dancer, really. I have to throw that way. So what am I going to really do with my life now? Because honestly, by this time, I had to do come at NCU. And I was doing it because I never get forgot Edna. So I choose the next easiest thing at NCU for getting out without maths. Honestly, that's why I chose it initially. I mean, I said, all right, I don't know what am I going to do with my life. But okay. My day at school and may I try to adjust and may I just I try to figure my way through. May I try to get for learn to live with this thing because having it in, I'm affected by loudspeakers, chainsaws, drills, cell jackhammers, phone. cell phones. I trigger alarms. So like the first time I travel with the device, I trigger the alarm, so you know them treat me like terrorists, carry me go in a room, test my finger for explosives and all of these bugger <laughs> things. Yeah, I have to change how I eat really, I can't consume stuff with caffeine, so I can't have a drink of Pepsi when I'm thirsty, <laughs> nothing, can't drink of coffee, if I'm up a study, everybody can drink them Red Bull, me can do that, and when I see people just i be hyperactive and never run and never dance and all these things. It used to make me feel away. Honestly, come here and say, that used to be me and that's not me anymore. So, what am I supposed to do in my life now? I don't know. So, I kind of felt helpless in a them time there and hopeless. And depressed. And dep- not that Listen, not to mention depressed. I did depressed, I don't like. More surgeries along the way. More surgeries along the way. Where are you now? Surgery number three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I before we reach the surgery number three, I remember my teller said GPA, they are one point something. My yeah. NCU almost get kicked out. So I had to sit out more semesters. And the time when I got shocked in March 2013, um, I went back home after that because I was spending some time in Kingston. When I went back home, I go back to school and one day I feel like I walk on air. I say, no, let me walk. I just feel like I walk in a slow motion and I walk on air and I feel funny. So I messaged my doctor and by now you hear me say I message my doctor enough time. We have that kind of relationship, especially because my condition is so rare, mm. they can't take any chances. So I messaged him and him said, leave school and try to get your blood pressure checked. I left school, I said the nurse on the, on the roadside of Monday like a free blood pressure. I check it, she said low. So my doctor said, all right, can you try to get an x-ray now? So I messaged my doctor, Bridget, Dr. Walcott, and him, I said, oh, I need an x-ray ASAP. I left Mandeville, go to in hospital, and him squeeze me in for get an x-ray done. We do the x-ray, I take a picture of the x-ray, send go give my doctor Kingston and him say, yeah, this not look right. I saw him the Friday for clinic because him come out Mandeville every three months for for battery clinic. So okay. people pay me and him think this, I have oh. to do that every three months. Oh. So um, when he came down, I saw him for my checkup 
and he looked at the x-ray again and he said if i call kingston now and him have a bed available i'm taking you up with me this is an emergency so i say what happened what happened so it turned out that when we did get shocked the night there the battery shocked me so hard that the wire from the battery run go down in my heart it shift and it was seeming to pierce my heart from the inside so yeah so the wire did actually bore my heart from the inside for go outside so no bed never did it so him end up go kingston leave me and me go kingston but the monday or the tuesday them admit me for a couple of days and they finally did a procedure where they have to put me to sleep and put a hose with a camera down my throat and when them look them realize that the wire did shift but it's sitting right at the bottom of the right side of my heart and because the right side of my heart kind of thin the x-ray did show like it'll go outside but it was right at the bottom it wasn't going outside luckily so them let me out of hospital i go back to school and I think I had to sit out that semester because me just did really sick. But pick up the pieces again after recovery and me I try and move on with my life and upgrades I pick up them time yeah. Girl make it pan deans, listen beer things, me I go on with my little self come and I say, listen, alright, this is what's happening, me just have to accept it. And me just have to keep pushing forward. And me have to do my best at whatever me I do. Grades pick up met Dean's List. I ended up um, finishing my degree. So GPA jumped from 1.98 to 3.23. Kind of girl bright and thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I ended up getting a job at JNN with, Ms. with the late Michael, Michael Sharp. Sharp. Yeah, and it so happened that I remember tell us uh, me did just choose Mascom because I did the easiest thing right. to do. I ended up falling in love with it. Mm. So, yeah, me I do my thing and discovered that I have an, a good presenting voice and Michael <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> and Michael Sharp helped me for milk that even more. So, I started working at Jane and with him. I was the main news anchor there for a while and host and producer and all of that. And throughout that time, I was still having complications quietly mm. like I used to notice that the battery just not there where it used to be. It just... Oh, you figured that out on your set, on your own? Yeah, because me, listen, I, I look on it often. I have to check if no little changes did it, and I admire my body a lot. So I have to look for the least change. So I keep on and notice it. And then, because really and truly, it was here right mm -hmm. and then after a while i noticed that the top of it was down here oh. yeah so that's not right and then after a while um, my doctors they weren't um hasty to do anything about it they said All right, let's keep observing and then after a couple months and it went over to a year because really and truly we started noticing the change from 2015 but they weren't so hasty to cut me again so then say make we watch it we watch it and it reached 2018 now to the point where the battery just fully dropped down in my breast and we had to do something by this time because it was causing swelling in my left breast a lot of discomfort sometimes i have fever in my breast so it did, it was a lot so they said all right we have to fix it and we did a surgery to in 20, June 2018, we did a surgery and we lifted... That was surgery number... Three. Four, number three? Yes. Whoa. So we lifted it out of my breast and we brought it back up to where it was initially. And what the doctors did, they put it in a mesh and stitched down the mesh to my flesh so that it wouldn't move easily again. So we did that. Um, no complications. And I had to miss work. And I recovered. I went back to work. I read news and doing all of these things just living my life and one day i went to the bathroom at work and when i come back i fix my jacket so i went like this and when i went like this i feel some hook my flesh from the inside and it did so painful i actually scream and i couldn't move but my hand because it's hot so when it finally got loose now my message my doctor and i said um yeah something is not right and i sent him a picture of the area i miss one something i point out so 
So I left work and I went to see him and he said, okay, this is part of the mesh that's eroding your flesh from the inside. If this rips your flesh, if this rips your skin, you have risk infection, heart infection. So we'll have to operate again. So here comes surgery number four. So this was, this was July 2018. We did that surgery and cut off the part of the mesh that was causing the trouble. The only issue I had after that surgery was that I couldn't keep down nothing, not even water for a while. But I recovered and I moved on with my life. And then 2019, this is surgery number five. <laughs> 2019, I was getting ready for work one morning and I heard a loud beeping. So I thought it was my alarm. So I checked my phone, it wasn't my phone. It wasn't my tablet. And when I went like this, I realized that the beeping had come from inside of me. So I said, what is this? So I kind of did a panic, but I said, all right, keep it cool, abs. Keep it cool. I messaged my doctor and tell him, all right, come see me now. I went to see him. And when him check the device, I get to an error message. So I said, Lord Jesus of mercy. The device where I monitor my heart and keep me alive. Give error message. I give an error message. What does this mean? So he had to contact the manufacturers overseas who make the battery. And by the evening, they got back to him and said something is off with the longevity assessment and calculations. So the battery no good again, basically. So they had to make a new one and send it for me, which took a while. So, can imagine. Yeah, so from February 2019 to June 2019, I was beeping 16 times every eight hours. So every so every eight hours, it mm. beeps 16, 16 times. Oh, okay. Yeah. Whoa. And this, hap this continued from February to June because they had to make the battery and when they sent it, some hold up did their customs and <laughs> a bag of things. Oh boy. <laughs> yes, I'm holding up a custom, so the mafia cancel the surgery dates and a bugger thing. So, anyway, 2019, now I think June, we finally got to take that device out and put the new one in. But one of the blessings in that is that because when the battery start malfunction, it was supposed to have about five years left. But because it start malfunction before time and it's not my fault, you get a new it was on warranty. So this one is free. Mad. Otherwise, I <laughs> would have to find like 20,000 US out of my pocket. I don't have it. I was a sister part, master, God, and God. <laughs> I don't have it. So that, that was a blessing for me. So we put the new device in. The only complication I have from that was that after the surgery, I come out of surgery with my skin, I burn me like crazy. Like, I feel like it did on fire. Nurse, nasty nothing. The doctor, them nasty nothing. I said, I'm not sure, no nasty nothing. They said, I'm nasty nothing. And by the next morning, the whole of my upper body, shoulder, chest, back, everywhere, my side, burn. So it turned out that because I've been doing surgery so often, my body has become sensitive to the skin cleaning agent, to the means mm. cleaning off mm. before surgery. So everywhere where them clean off for me before surgery, burn up. So it just full of wheel and it red. And then after a while, it started to get dark, like me literally burn up. But yeah, me did eventually recover from that. And the only other issue was that... Um, because I did so many surgeries as well, that part of my skin, it keeps stretching because I keep getting cut at the same spot. Right. So when people do surgery, them for them scar left a thin line. My thin line start get wide. So I as you can time see, it cut. yeah, yeah, it's very wide. So they wanted to do plastic surgery to fix it, but it's risky to fix it. Mm -hmm. They would have had to take flesh from my hip or my bottom to patch it. And if I patch it, I'll have to patch it again in six months. So what them do, them just leave it. And hopefully they can fix it at my next surgery, which is when this battery finish, which is in five years. Surgery number six. How have you been able to, to treat with all of these financially, these surgeries financially though? Um, family. <laughs> Honestly, family always have to so cover family. me. Because it's expensive. Hospital fee, you, you have to pay at least 70 or 90% of it before you even get a bed. 
for lie down pan. So all of those surgeries I've had to pay hospital fee. And of course I have to buy my medication every month. I have to see my doctor every three months for my regular checkups for my heart and on the battery. I also have to do regular heart tests to see how I'm progressing because as I said earlier the condition is progressive which means as I get older it's going to, to get, get worse. worse. That's according to science, I know that right, God right, said. Right. So yeah, as I get older, science says my heart will deteriorate. Between 2011 and now, luckily there hasn't been any major deterioration. And I can credit that to my lifestyle. I have, I'm gonna eat that bad. I'm not think me eat that bad. I mean, sometimes I double in a little fried chicken and a little KFC and so. <laughs> But I don't eat that bad and I've always wanted to exercise and at first it was it was seen as a big risk because studies have shown that exercise speeds up the progression of the disease. Mm. Which means if my exercise it's because your heart is doing more work. Yeah. So if my exercise my heart are gonna deteriorate faster. But luckily in my case after my bottom my doctor, my bottom my doctor he did research, he made um, contact with other doctors overseas and consultations and research, went up for research and I finally got the go ahead to do some exercise but I have to keep my heart rate at a certain level. So when I got that green light, I really started exercising in 2020, I started the gym. I remember. And yeah, I started, but I just thought it was such a struggle like five little squats on me are dead my heart had bust through my chest um but over time with consistency and discipline and doing it over time and having my heart getting used to it and conditioning my heart no girl i lift weights listen girl i did lift 150 pounds and then something there and i couldn't do that before also one big improvement that my doctor is impressed with is the fact that my heart recovery rate has improved mm. meaning before consistent exercise when i would start to exercise when my heart rate go up it stay high for a long time but now when my heart rate go up in less than a minute it's back down to a normal rate which is my doctor finds that very impressive so we are hoping that it continues on that path that would be great yeah your degree program, I think, arts and communication, as just mass communication. Mass communication, but okay. my emphasis was in television production and broadcasting. Mm. Yeah. It was supposed to be four years. Mm -hmm. It lasted seven years. Seven years. Yes, I thought four semesters. Basically, about three. Three, I think. I think three full semesters. Well, you still make it happen. Still make it happen. Amazing stuff. <laughs> yeah, I had to just go back in and pull up my socks, as the yes. elder people would say, and just focus, and I made up my mind to finish strong. I started out weak, but I said, I have to finish strong. Mm -hmm. I have to finish strong. Back yeah. to the, the cardioverter, because they mm -hmm. say it shocks. Mm -hmm. When it shocks you, if somebody is holding you right close. Yeah, they'll feel it. Yeah, and part of the, the challenge too is, as you said, physical, physical activities would have been mm -hmm. a no-no in the past. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that probably having kids and I remember when I was talking to you, when we just started communicating, I said, having sex mm -hmm. is a risk. <laughs> mm -hmm. that, that's a risk because during sex, heart rate will go up. So there's a risk of getting shocked during sex. So I have to pace myself right. during sex. Um, also, having kids is a risk because pregnancy puts a lot of stress on the heart. <laughs> well, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And especially on the heart yeah. and only one side of my heart is functioning properly so that that's a risk that's also yeah. there's a risk of me passing on the disease to a child no one put an innocent picture uh, because so i got, it, so I got it from my mom yeah so i don't want to put a child through that so yeah that's that's scary for yeah me. next thing because if 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 you are get shot that means uh, if we're having sex and we can get tracked to. Yes. Then we love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lucky, luckily. It has never happened. It has never happened. It and, has and, I, and I hope it doesn't. Yeah, because uh, it's, it's, very, it's a very scary experience. It's about a shock to your system. <laughs> that yeah. that would be it. It's a, it's a very scary experience. Your mom died when she was 39. Mm -hmm. I know, so speaking to you that 
one of your goals is to outlive mommy. Yeah. You are now 29. 29. Yep. So, I'm 29 now. She died at 39. And me, I go back till I reach 99. Or maybe 109 for a little razzle dazzle, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that does sound bad at all. Uh, yeah, me I live till I'm of his son, me. Uh, as well, country people would have said, yeah, me I live on a journey for live long. And I am going to continue kicking this heart diseases, but and I want to help other people to do the same thing. Speaking about helping other people to do the same thing, in 2013, mm -hmm. I started the, the I Have a Heart Foundation mm -hmm. to sensitize, educate people about heart disease and, and also to get assistance for people who needed that. Mm -hmm. Amazing stuff. Yeah, How is that you. going? Um, it has been going good. Um, when I just started it, actually the idea for it came to me when I did it on my back in a hospital, lungs collapse and everything. I mean, I said, God, if I make it through this, I want to help other people where I go through this. Because heart disease are not easy something to live with. Also, Heart disease is the leading cause of death in Jamaica, and not a lot of people know that. And most of these heart disease deaths, they are preventable. They can be prevented with proper screening, early screening, don't ignore symptoms. Enough people are walking around with heart disease and don't know because one of the common symptoms, chest pain, swelling, hands and feet. So for the chest pain, they must say, all right, I guess I'm going to drink a little tea or drink one hot ginger beer. No. For the swelling of the feet, they probably say, oh, because I stand up whole day or because I sit down too long. No, people need to get screened. A lot of people also deliberately ignore symptoms because they're afraid of going to the doctor, <laughs> which should not be the case. Also, a lot of these deaths, they're sudden, so people just drop down and dead from cardiac arrest or heart attack. And it is when them do autopsy, them find out say yeah the person that have heart disease or whatever so people need to get screened and people need to exercise people need to eat healthy you know and there's not a lot of public education about these things um so i want to play my part in doing that also a lot of people die from heart disease because they cannot afford treatment which is a very sad reality um i was blessed enough to have gotten help from my family and you know a lot of people don't have that support so i wanted to be that voice for those people and to be a help for those people so initially my advocacy works was touring high schools and sure doing a lot of interviews on radio and tv all over the place sharing my story telling people how them can take care of them heart how to prevent heart disease or how to manage it if you already have it um, so that was the early years in 20, late 2018, 2019, I, my foundation partnered with an overseas organization. That's the Organization for International Development. And between 2019 and early 2020, we did a cardiac mission where we assisted 23 people in getting free heart surgery. They couldn't afford it and they would have died if they didn't get the surgeries done so we, we did that through that partnership um we want to do it again 2023 so we're working towards that also at the regular blood drives where i try to help build and replenish the blood bank general supply because blood always short people need blood every if you day operation you definitely need blood exactly and to do heart surgeries it takes a lot of blood so I do that to help my fellow heart warriors and the blood also help other people, pregnant women, crash victim people who get shot, stab, um, people who do have to do dialysis and all of them something there. So I do that. Also, um, my advocacy has led me into a meeting with the Honorable Brogard. <laughs> and I, in that meeting, I shared with him some of the challenges within our cardiac care sector. And one of those challenges was the need for a perfusionist. Mm -hmm. And a perfusionist is somebody who operates the heart-lung machine during a heart surgery. And you did need perfusionists. And he announced in 2020 that government is offering two full scholarships for persons to study perfusion medicine. And I was saying, okay, so this is what my purpose really is, to be an advocate, to be a voice, to 
help other people. So through all of this that I've been through on this journey, I found the passion and the purpose through my pain and I found the testimony in all the tests that I went through. So I lost, I had to throw away my gift of dancing, dancing. but God opened my eyes and gave me the gift of my voice, not only as a voiceover talent or as a news reporter, mm -hmm. but as an advocate. Yes. So a lot of times when we lose something, God is preparing us for bigger and better. better yeah. So this is just what my purpose is. I people ask me all the time, do you want healing? Um yes and no. While one day I'd want to do things like skydiving or ride a roller coaster and all of that, I'm not chasing it. I'm not run down the healing when God ready for heal me and heal me because this I am who I am and I am what I am today because of this. Everybody know me as the girl with the battery in her heart and I, I don't mind that. This scar on my chest is my S on my chest. Superman have the S on him chest, this is my S. It reminds me of all the battles that I fought and won. And all the battles that I have to come that I will also win. It also reminds me of my purpose which is to help other people mm -hmm. yeah. the name of the, of the series which is new you are the first person is amazing jamaican so i couldn't have found anybody more amazing <laughs> than abby in yeah. 2020 you were an awardee the prime minister national, national youth, youth award awardee. for excellence yeah. nation, nation building nation building yeah <laughs> big up yourself mama <laughs> My thing. yeah it's because of my works and my advocacy you know um it's it's good to know that he recognizes the work of the young people. And I mean, I don't do what I do for the applause and all of that. I do it because I genuinely want to help. But at the same time, it feels good to be rewarded. And them say, reward sweeten labor, or so it goes. So, yeah, so it's a little boost for me if I got even harder, you know what I mean? To do all I can to help other people. and. My foundation is my baby and as much as I can't help a lot of people right now, in the future I know that I will. My long term goal is to help people financially because enough people just can't afford them surgeries and things and I want to help with that. Mm -hmm. That is one of my main goals, you know what I mean? People don't have to die from heart disease but a lot of people die because they feel resources. like they don't have a choice because of resources. So. Yeah, I want to step in and help with that. Mm. <laughs> you made mention, and, and I told you congratulations a long time ago about that, but congratulations again. Thank you deserve you. that. Thank you. You made mention earlier that you are a vo voice over artist. Mm -hmm. you, your voice is in and behind many popular advertisements in the country. Yes, on TV, Jay. The voice that I want. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And and for people who want to reach out to you for foundation purposes, blood drive purposes, voiceover purposes, mm -hmm. or just to encourage and you know probably feed off of your vibe and energy how they reach you. Alright, so on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, it's this is abs. So it's T H I S I Z A B Z on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or you can reach me at 566-6405. Run a number again. 566-6405. Or if you're sophisticated and very corporate, you can email me at abigay.smythe at gmail.com. Abby. Yes? You are an amazing woman. <laughs> Thank you. You have overcome, continue to overcome, and despite your challenges, you have also found the time and energy to help many others and that is really and truly admirable and noble of you Thank keep you. fighting the fight as i said i have been communicating with you since about 2018 i think yeah, yeah, about about. and i have seen and especially with the exercise thing mm -hmm. right now you make me look like me a fool and me <laughs> also living at the gym and them something listen so, i'm now a certified fitness trainer I so just hit me, me up follow the thing, man. Me follow the just thing. hit me up yeah, I'm a trainer. Really amazing. I saw you doing a little bit of dancing as well with mm -hmm. a couple of your, your girlfriends and stuff. And I yeah. see that 
you are in a good place. Yeah, I try to. And after all the challenges, you deserve that. Yeah, so thank continue you. to fight the fight, continue to help as many as you can. You know, with the year, for, yeah. for when, when you need a platform to you know, reach yeah, the people, you're always there. I appreciate so, that. Keep fighting, and you're an amazing young lady. Thank you. Tony Stark, what I'll say, Abby Stark. Yeah. The girl with the iron heart. Yeah. Big up yourself, man. All Smart right. thing, man. Teach them. Hey, yo, hello. Send the message and make it reach them. It's teach them right here. Warlord representing. Thank you for watching. Like the video before you go. Please subscribe if you haven't done so. And remember to share the video with your friends and family. And browse the channel for more quality content. Until next time, walk good, my friends. Teach them!